uh, Bernard, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody to this kickoff workshop uh, on digital trade. You all know what we're trying to do here. It's, uh, it's going to be very fast and efficient. So the idea is to have a lot of speakers weigh in on what are some of the key questions that we should be focusing on in this CBCA project. Um, we also have, um, it's not just the CBCA project, we have an ongoing set of collaborations on, on services trade in particular. So we also have Jane Brockman with us, who will say a little bit about um, what she's going to be, what she is doing uh, in her project. So we'll start with uh, Martina. Why don't you take us through what, what CBCA is? My main job today is going to be to keep us on time because there's a lot of speakers and we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to be a bit brutal. If I have to, that's my job today. So Martina. Yes, thanks, Bernard. And uh, Mia, if you can allow me to share, uh, I will share my screen. And yeah, thanks everybody for accepting our invite. Um, I'm very, I'm very glad we we made it eventually. And sorry for bothering you with all the emails of arranging for arranging this uh, event. Uh, so I will just take a few minutes to present you the uh, our project, which is. Uh, been approved uh, for uh, a grant from Civica, and um, and we are we are, this is the first official kick of this project, which will take place uh, starting from today to um, towards uh, the whole academic uh, year next year. Um, so, uh, the, there are three main objectives of this project. Um, the first is to create a network of experts on digital trade. And the idea is to uh, foster the collaboration between the four Civica universities, which are part of this uh, project, and also beyond this. So we already have started expanding this collaboration, and we are very happy to have other institutions. And I will uh, uh, tell you about those that already are uh, partners of the project in, uh, in a bit. Uh, the second uh, objective is to create an open data set of digital trade restrictions. Uh, we aim to cover at least uh, 50 countries uh, for the first launch, but the idea is in the long term to expand and cover eventually all the countries uh, worldwide. And then uh, the third objective is to create an index on digital trade integration uh, that uh, will be based on the data set that we uh, build for these 50 countries. So all in all, uh, this uh, project aims, first of all, to identify best practices on how to deal with the digital policies in a way that uh, uh, the policy objectives of the countries are achieved without creating unnecessary restrictions on digital trade. We aim to improve transparency on these measures. There is still not enough transparency on uh, uh, which measures apply and create uh, problems uh, for uh, the digital economy. So we aim to uh, support uh, the creation of transparency on that front. Uh, also, by doing that and um, uh, create this data set, we aim to provide a way of uh, having a comparison between countries and between different policy regimes across countries. Um, and this can also be important as an input for policymakers that um, have to develop new policies. And finally, uh, we this project also, uh, by creating the data set, but also the index, creates a basis for quantitative analysis um, in the future. Uh, that already with the, uh, my colleague Eric, we, we have done in the past with the uh, past indexes we have uh, created. And I, we think this is very important as a basis uh, for, for, again, improving transparency on, uh, on what uh, creates a restriction on, uh, on digital trade. So the timeline uh, for this project after our kickoff today and the kickoff, official kickoff of our collaboration is uh, um, through, to, from September to February to organize uh, seminars uh, to define the methodology on, for assessing uh, policy measures. So the idea is to uh, organize bi-weekly or three-weekly um, events in which we discuss what can be a best practice on different topics, on, on how to address different uh, areas um, in a way that um, avoids unnecessary restrictions on digital trade. Uh, during the same period, we also start collecting um, the, the measures, the, con the, the, the restrictions, and uh, we, uh, through the Civica grant, we have at least 10 PhD students who will be working on uh, and helping on collecting this sort of information. Then uh, from March to May, we are gonna use the information we have collected to uh, create the in index. And then uh, in May, we can release the website with the data set and the index. And finally, in September, 
um, we uh, aim to release the first annual report uh, with the uh, data uh, and information that we have uh, created and uh, calculated. And uh, uh, this is the first annual report because the idea is to for this project to be long term. So every year um, um, there could be uh, there should be a release of a new report showing what has changed through throughout the, the year. So the four Civica partners of this project are um, together with the UI, Bocconi University, LSE, and RT, who are all present uh, in this uh, event today. And also we have uh, um, three uh, EU UN agencies, uh, secretariats uh, that have uh, joined us. Uh, we have a UNESCAP, uh, UN ECLAC, and UNECA. And uh, we have today uh, UNESCAP present here, and uh, Jan will, uh, will present in a bit what they have been doing on digital trade. We also have uh, the TISA network, and we have today Jane, uh, who is also going to present what uh, TISA is doing, and ESIP uh, with Eric van der Marel, who is also here today. Um, so the next steps uh, for this summer, our uh, to-do list is uh, to start uh, creating our network. So we already have received a lot of interest and more people have joined. So I'm keeping track of all the people who were asked uh, to join and keep inform be, be kept informed about uh, uh, our activities. Um, then uh, the, the idea is to have uh, in early October a first event, hopefully in person, in presence, uh, and uh, uh, we, we will be glad to host you at the UI for this. And uh, we also have to start creating a calendar for our seminars for the next uh, academic year. And uh, we have to start the selection of the 10 PhD students. So this is our to-do list um, uh, before uh, the new academic year starts. And uh, well, thanks uh, uh, for joining uh, this project and uh, looking forward to start uh, collaborating. Great, thanks for that. Jane. Thank you, Bernard. Well, just quickly, uh, I'm an industry professor at the University of Adelaide's Institute for International Trade. And I convene this uh, European Commission funded Jean Monnet network uh, which covers seven university partners, uh, TISA we call ourselves, Trade and Investment in Services Associates, and we're an interdisciplinary grouping, chiefly across economics and law. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on what we do, but I will start copying in those of you who want to be copied into what we do. But all and everything to do with trade and services, including, of course, digital services, which despite the barriers um, is growing faster now than overall trade in services, whether it's digitally ordered and delivered, plus the cross-border data flows associated with it in, in um, many different ways, all of the TISA partners are working on digital services trade issues. And we're delighted to be working with the Civica partners on the digital trade integration project. I don't know many of you personally, though I do know some of you. Uh, I work very closely in Vietnam with Claudio Daugherty, for example, and of course, Debbie Orms, who's based in Singapore and is a speaker today, is, is a longtime colleague. But some of you may know some of my colleagues from Adelaide, uh, including perhaps Emeritus Professor Christopher Finlay, or as of today, we're joined by Lee Tuthill, who until yesterday was principal counselor at the WTO uh, Division on Trade and Services and longtime lead on e-commerce. And you may know some of the other TISA participants, uh, some of whom are registered uh, here today. I see Hildegorn online, for example. So just very quickly, who they are. Joe Francois is from uh, World Trade Institute at the University of Bern. Uh, Hein Rolfsimmer at Utrecht University, um, Magnus Lodfalk and Hildegun Nordas with Örebro in Sweden, Ingo Borschett from Sussex University and in Asia, uh, Brian Mercurio at the School of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Xin Peng, also a professor of law at National Tsinghua University in Chinese Taipei, and Xinxuan Tu at the China Institute for WTO Studies at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. So you can see that is a very um, mixed uh, network. 
uh, that spans uh, Europe and uh, Asia Pacific and where we're delighted to, to be working with you. I'll Thanks. leave it there. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Jane. Yeah, so obviously that's item number one on uh, Martina's list in terms of the network. So I think kind of combining the more traditional, if I can say traditional, work on trade and services with the digital is, is a, going to be really interesting. Yum. You're mute, Jan. I'm mute. Okay, thank you, Martina. Uh, I'm Jan Duval. I'm the acting director of the Trade Investment and uh, Innovation Division uh, of ESCAP. Uh, we're very pleased to be uh, part of this initiative uh, with uh, Bernard and, and Martina. Um, we, uh, we've done quite a bit of work in, uh, let's say, over the past year on uh, digital uh, trade integration. Actually, we have, we have our own uh, index, right, on uh, regional digital trade integration. I think it's called that way, right? Uh, Martina was, was, uh, was the one developing it for us, uh, with us. Uh, and it was actually as part of an ESCAP OECD uh, research project, right? Uh, but just to give uh, you where, where we come uh, from uh, and the background of that research is that, uh, I mean, ESCAP is a regional commission of the United Nations, right? So one of our mandates is to foster uh, cooperation among our member states uh, and foster regional integration among our member states, which is 54 member states. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really a big group. Uh, and so one thing we've been working on uh, lately is a development of a regional integration index. Um, and so we've been looking at what our colleagues from ECA and Africa were doing. We've been looking at what some of our colleagues from uh, Asian Development Bank uh, have done in terms of development of regional integration index. And so we built on that and we developed uh, something called DG3, the Digital and Sustainable Regional Integration Index, because we wanted to add it to add the sustainable dimension, which is key to the UN, uh, and also the digital dimension that is becoming very important. So as part of this, we've got a pretty complicated uh, index put together. Uh, and one of the sub sub index is actually this regional uh, digital trade uh, integration index we have. So we've collected uh, with the help of, of Martina and the host of, uh, of national consultants, um, we've collected data for about 20 countries. Uh, over the past uh, six months, uh, and so that's what, uh, in a way, we, we also bring to the to the initiative, right? Uh, our interest in coming into the initiative is that uh, I mean we don't really have the time and resources uh, to actually keep uh, the uh, the index updated. Uh, so we hope uh, that as part of this bigger partnership uh, with leading uh, research and, and uh, academic uh, uh, people, I think we can we can keep it going. Uh, and, and, uh, and rely on it. One of the things I want to mention as well is that this is a very, I mean, number one, this, as of January, uh, this has become a very important topic for us. Uh, we have uh, something called an intergovernmental committee on trade and investment that meets every, uh, every two years. And when they met uh, two months ago, they highlighted digital trade as the number one thing that they wanted to, uh, us to focus on. So uh, we have to do more work on this. At the same time, what this means uh, is that uh, it's very sensitive. Uh, you know, I'm from, we, are, we are from Asia Pacific, so we've got China here, we've got India in our group, we've got Australia, we've got using a lot of very different approaches in this area, uh, and, and this, some disagreements on, on what's the best policy. Are. So what we are looking for, uh, also in this, by participating in this initiative, uh, is, is really uh, to improve the existing indicators that are there. Uh, we want to ensure they are based on actual regulations as much as possible, right? Uh, we want to, uh, them to be updated regularly uh, and because the regulations keep moving very fast, right? Uh, what uh, we, we also would like to ensure is that, that nobody passes very hard judgment on whether a policy is, is good or not, is best or not, because, or appropriate or not, because they have very different views uh, across countries on this issue. Um, and, and so that's still a very difficult topic. So I think we should all keep a very open mind on that. And then the last thing is uh, I'd like to mention uh, is that, uh, so again, a very group of partners, I mean, uh, super happy to participate. Uh, what we would like to see in the development of the network, uh, Martina, as we move on this, is that if we can bring uh, more relevant, uh, more, I mean, research institution from 
uh, other regions, right, from Asia Pacific in particular, that would be great. Obviously, I mean, we have the ARPNET network, where the Asia Pacific Research Engineering Network on Trade, we can tap in. And I'm very happy to hear from Jane as well, that we have, uh, that she has contacts there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jan. So we can come back uh, to this. Obviously, the, uh, the political sensitivities are more on your plate than they are on ours. Uh, that's what we have <laughs> academics for. So I think we can actually help you by you know, putting objective analysis and facts on the table. So um, that's really, I think, where, where our comparative advantage is. And obviously we will recognize the politics, but will not be influenced by them in terms of analysis, right? So you better know upfront what you're getting into. <laughs> But obviously we understand the, the background. Listen, we're already a bit over time. So I suggest we start immediately with uh, the first substantive topic. So oh, sorry, to there Eric. is Eric as well. Just yeah, to... but you told me to be tough. So okay. Eric, I'll give you 30 seconds. I mean, we all know what ESAP's been doing, but otherwise we're eating into the time. Uh, no, I mean, I can be very quick. I mean, we are a research institute on international political economy, but more specifically on international trade. And over the last uh, many years, we have been doing a lot of research on um, digital trade and digital services trade in particular. And I guess, I mean, uh, everybody knows by now, I think that we created digital restrictiveness index and, you know, me and Martina have also done it like a step further in doing lots of uh, policy research analysis with this index and other indicators of restrictiveness and digital services trade competitiveness so there you go that's what we do yep so eric is of course an economist so he's uh, really focused on what the effects of all of this are in terms of economic of Im impacts uh, clearly that's one of the things we're really interested in using ultimately the index for is to get a sense of what actually matters and which elements of what goes into the index actually matter more than others um, so that's all the research agenda. Thanks, Eric. So let's start now with Laurent, who is going to speak on <coughs> the IPR dimension of, of digital trade. Laurent, you're on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation, Bernard. I would just wish to introduce myself very rapidly. I am a professor of intellectual property law at Bocconi University for the last 17 years. But I have, I had, and I have a kind of double life. Uh, I have a, a public one. Uh, I have uh, worked for many, many years as uh, in the United Nations system. And uh, I was WIPO, a senior official and spokesman of the organization. And I have major interests in, uh, uh, in making a bridge and understanding how the world functions now from the academic side and also advising governments and organizations. I've been very active in, uh, uh, in Asia, in China, in Vietnam, by the way, our colleague mentioned Claudio Dordi's project. And uh, I am very much interested to see how, as professor of intellectual property law, uh, digitalization, the digital world, uh, affects the relation between intellectual property and trade. How intellectual property can be valued as an asset or as a toll, as a tool or as a toll. And this is what I would wish to uh, review with you very, very briefly this morning. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Gabriele Galliani, will be uh, my discussion today. We work together actually on international matters, uh, in particular with Asia. And uh, as such, uh, we, uh, we also pre prepared together uh, to respect the time that uh, Bernard and all colleagues intend that be respected. So uh, I would wish to share rapidly some slides and I'll try really not to be long. I'll skip some of them, but I'll give them all of them to you for, uh, for record. I thought I had 15 minutes, but then I have five. So I, and then we will have more time for the debate. So I have made more slides, but I shall share them with you. Okay, so let me be on the right ones. Okay. Excellent. Uh, can you see the slides correctly? Yes. Excellent. You just need to go full screen. Yeah, I put them full screen. Okay, that's very good. So we'll see uh, rapidly uh, why the artificial intelligence led revolution has uh, wider trade implications and how 
uh, this goes even beyond digitalization. And therefore, this is even perhaps, though we have put it at the first presentation today, this is even beyond digital trade. This is what awaits us in 10 years time, I would say, five, 10 years time, but policymakers and academics have to be ready for this. So uh, very rapidly, uh, I'll go through the AI revolution. I won't, I won't go too much through the definitions of AI that provoked this revolution. Uh, I'll focus on the fact that this revolution is led by Eastern Asia and North America. Europe is out. And uh, uh, what open debates does this create for uh, trade related matters? Um, fundamentally, the AI revolution is an old and a new revolution. The concept of AI invented an invented term at a conference in 1957 uh, was uh, received by society with great enthusiasm in the West and in the East as being a new solution, the robots of the 1960s. Yet, uh, there were two eclipses in this revolution due to the limitations of the computing machine, the uh, impossibility to absorb, uh, analyze data. And uh, it's back since the 2000s, since machines are far more powerful. And as such, artificial intelligence is really the question of tomorrow, a question that challenges society, ethics, economics, and uh, so many aspects in society and also culture. So um, there are many definitions of AI. So we may talk about everything and nothing when we talk of AI. And clearly enough, this is a step beyond digitalization. So it is super uh, AI seen in a trade perspective is super digital trade in a way. A trade, uh, a trade of goods uh, and services that are uh, uh, produced perhaps ordered by a machine, produced by a, mach by a machine, perhaps even ordered by a machine for a machine. Okay, something that goes beyond what we have up to now seen. And there is a constant evolution of the definition of AI. It may be super intelligence. It may mean a system that think like human, humans, act like humans, think rationally, act rationally. It may simply mean intelligent agents, or only a machine that treats what mankind, what a human is ordering to do. So something very basic, something which is really the, the smallest definition of AI. Okay, WIPO in its technology trends report limited itself to a very limited definition, to a narrow definition uh, of the tasks performed by a learning system. It is sure that in analyzing the new trends of digital trade, there is a need, a scientific need from the academic point of view to work further on these definitions. And this is something on which at Bocconi, we are trying to uh, work upon. Now, uh, uh, still uh, under the definitions of AI, even under the WIPO limited definition of AI, uh, the, uh, there are three categories that we are interested in uh, considering, the technique used in AI, the functional applications, and the various application field, okay? Now, this completely revisits the concepts of intellectual property and has major effects on trade rules, or will have major effects on trade rules. First of all, the issue of AI output. Okay, so in this case, the concept of inventor, of authorship, of originality, of non-obviousness are so different that what rules should exist in trade and what, how can we analyze the data connected to this so that we can individualize how this process uh, takes place for us. Then there is, of course, the aspect of the input. What is the liability of, for the AI creations? It's less interesting for trade, but it still has an effect on trade rules, okay? Uh, uh, what's the property, the property right, the ownership on those who feed the machine? And connected to this, platforms, platforms can become data mills. 
And therefore, who is the author of the traded good of service? So uh, how can states consider in a, in a far more digitalized world, in the next step, how can states consider the differences between goods and services produced by humans and produced by machines, self-governed machines, or machines that are merely the hand or the arm of human being. Okay, so in this, IP can be uh, supported by AI because it permits also to avoid some abuses of the IP system among those that have been criticized these days with the issues connected to the patent system. So, uh, uh, and patents and medicine in the current case. So clearly enough, this has effect on trade enforcement. AI may help in getting a safer and better and more ethical world, or just the contrary, can be a devil. And this has important in, importance in uh, trade rules. Now, the revolution is led by Eastern Asia and to some extent North America. So the statistics are quite uh, uh, depressing for Europeans, uh, contrary to uh, what, uh, what uh, our friends today connected from the Asia Pacific may consider for their areas. There is a complete dominance of uh, uh, Chinese universities in uh, IP research, uh, uh, in AI research, in AI research, 17 out of 20 academic patents come from China. The remaining three are from Korea, the Republic of Korea. So we Europeans, we are more or less out. Out, uh, talking of companies, over the 500 uh, top patent applicants on AI inventions, there are 100 Chinese public research institutions US and Republic of Korea, 20, Japan and Europe, taken as a whole for each. We are out of the game of those who are getting ownership on AI. Not talking on, on inventions created by machines, not talking of accepting the machine as an inventor itself, which is another ethical question. Of course, while considering trade negotiations, and not only trade data, this has a major impact. Whereas Europeans talk uh, all the time of the potential of AI, this remains extremely theoretical. In practice, Asia and a bit America have the lead, have the, not the lead, the, the total lead. Now, uh, uh, there uh, is also a switch that is very important on trade, including in the light of what is happening now with the possible waivers on patents for medicines. Um, normally, creativity coming from uh, using artificial intelligence, still governed by humans, was protected through copyright. But the phase of maturity since above all the, uh, 2000, the 2010s and uh, 2013, is such, the field of maturity is such that creativity has switched from being protected by copyright, which is a loose protection, to being protected by what is applied of this creativity. That means goods and services and processes. That means protecting them by patents. And patents are far more stronger instruments. Uh, uh, we also know that in the current pandemic, many, uh, 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 not medicines, but devices were produced thanks to the use in Asia, uh, thanks to the use of in Asia of artificial intelligence. So clearly enough, uh, there is a phenomenon of appropriation and disappropriation of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, inventions it is led by machines. So on copyright, Europe in particular, debates strongly on who is the owner of the right, the machine or the human being. This is a theoretical question, a very academic question, far away from what we are discussing today in analyzing uh, uh, digital trade and its flaws. And this is an issue that uh, uh, 
would not be touched much here, but still I would wish to uh, raise this issue that fascinates the European Commission and their use. Uh, Can you uh, wrap up, Laurent, because we're running out of time. Yeah, I wrap up right now. And actually, uh, what I would wish to wrap up upon is the uh, big risk of a conflict between Europe and Eastern Asia on this crucial trade matter, having uh, the US, uh, Australia to an extent and others, as arbitrators of, uh, of this debate. How do we consider in trade uh, what is produced by, uh, by the machine autonomously? So not only digital trade, digital goods, but goods that are from an, a digital origin themselves. So, and that goes beyond. And we are much interested at Bocconi in learning from all of you, in constructing on how to classify this, on how to work with economists in creating uh, further bridges in this very sense. Thank you very much for your attention. I am at your full disposal for your questions today and also for interacting in the coming months and year in this splendid project. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be interesting to see how the Brussels effect kind of takes on this uh, very <laughs> imbalanced picture. Uh, Gabriel? Um, sure. I don't know what to do in terms of timing. I know Martina wanted to keep the introductory presentations very short, so... I will uh, be very short. Yeah, I will okay. be very short Thanks. and I've got my stopwatch. So just by way of introduction, yeah. very briefly, I'm a lecturer at Bocconi University and an adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University. I also work as a consultant, so I'm widely interested in trade, investment, and IP and their interactions in the real world. So here as a discussant, I just have uh, three general considerations, hopefully to foster the debate. Um, first of all, I think that, of course, IP measures concerning artificial intelligence are relevant per se and could constitute barriers to trade. However, I think that it's very important to always link them to data measures, uh, international trade in data. Why is that? Because I'm going to say a platitude, but of course data, as Professor Mandari was mentioning, are an input to AI, so are used in order for AI to be exploited and used, and also are an output. And therefore, any measure on data has the potential to magnify or to play down the effect of AI-related measures. So first of all, I, I think that this should be considered per se, but also in connection with data. That's fundamental for me. Second point, very important, I think, connected to this first one. We all know, of course, that both AI and data are discussed currently in e-commerce negotiation at the WTO, but they're also discussed at WIPO, okay? In that, so in, in, in different issues or sometimes even the same. And so when we classify these measures in, at the national level, I think it's important to take into account that the fact that we don't have currently a single regulatory framework is important because this creates problems in terms of uh, legal certainty and predictability. And this may be explosive or be used also as a justification from states. Third con consideration, and I will uh, stop here. The third one is that uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, also on data, of course, but uh, as we're talking about artificial intelligence here, I feel that uh, the discussion sometimes becomes intractable when there is a card that is put on the table that is currently widely used, we all know that, that is security. And this is something that already has come up in e-commerce negotiation at the WTO and AI, where the EU itself has basically pushed to prevent forced technology transfer. So basically, uh, practically the disclosure of the source code, while at the same time saying, well, but if we have a security issue here, we need to disclose that. And so I think that this is also important to be kept in mind when we are classifying these measures, because this is, to me, for now, an intractable issue. It's very difficult to strike a balance, but many measures are going to be defended on that basis. And uh, we'll stop here, 247. So uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so the whole idea here is to kind of identify what, what key questions are for us to focus on in this project in the coming, in the coming months and, and in the future. So floor is open. Let's spend five minutes kind of thinking about what was not there, what should be there, um, et cetera. So now <laughs> I think the best way to do this is through uh, 
you know, raise your hands. Uh, Bernard, can I suggest that uh, uh, since we are uh, very um, a bit late and uh, some people are really strict with the time they have to speak, uh, can we move the discussion on AI uh, when we do the intermediate liability, which is anyway connected, uh, so we can uh, uh, stay with the time we have uh, for, okay. for the next uh, two panels and then... Uh, Sorry for this. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that, that makes a lot of sense. And also, I think everybody feel free to use the chat. So you can put things into the chat, write it down, we'll save the chat. Um, and that's usually, that's a good way of kind of keeping a record and making sure that we don't, that you don't lose thoughts you have uh, as we move along. Okay, so let's then move to um, online payments. And we have Deborah Elms who is going to kick us off. Bernard, if I may just, I apologize to have been a bit long, but we had shared with Professor Galliani, we had agreed that I would be a bit longer and it would be a bit shorter. No worries, no worries, no worries. It was very, it was very interesting, I must say. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll discuss later. Yeah. Deborah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk, I was asked to talk about payments. I could have talked about lots of things in the digital space, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about payments for a minute. And um, I have a really short slideshow. Uh, you know, we're in the digital space. I, I sit in Singapore, uh, Asian Trade Center in Singapore, and we're in the digital space all day long. So actually another one of the slideshows that was on my desktop is a 97 slide deck, <laughs> which is helping ASEAN with the implementation of its e-commerce agreement uh, and all of the work plan activities attached to that. So, you know, we're way in the weeds of the digital economy, uh, particularly across Asia. But I'm gonna take a tiny piece of that and talk about it now, which is on payments. And I realize as I look at a predominantly European audience that this may not resonate with many of you because you think payments work beautifully, but in parts of the world and certainly here in Asia, cross-border payments are not working well. And in particular, um, they're not working well for smaller businesses. And so I was asked to present on this particular paper that we did earlier, which was about uh, helping cross-border retail payments for small businesses. And the, the challenges here are especially that when you can get paid, first of all, you can't always get paid for goods and services, but then when you do get paid, if you can manage to, the process at all, it can be slow, it can be inefficient, it can be incredibly expensive. And businesses who are trying to operate cross-border payments also have to deal with all kinds of incompatible systems like data field requirements and time zone challenges. So the bank is open here, but not there. And currency, uh, currency fluctuations, procedures and processes and codes and so forth. It can be a real nightmare. So even when you're doing a domestic level or what appears to be a domestic level transaction in payments, it may involve cross-border elements. So often the payment processors will have international databases to check for fraud. So even a, what appears to be you standing in front of the merchant to pay online actually may have an overseas component as well. So this is, this is genuinely a problem for a lot of different companies and even for consumers as well. One of the problems that we have is that we have limited commitments. This is one of those areas that is important to digital trade and, the, and digital services, but it falls between a lot of different areas. So often this is handled by central banks because it's a banking payments, et cetera, process. It's dealt with by trade. Nobody deals with it very well. Lots of the commitments that we have underway right now are limited in nature if they're existing at all. And they're mostly on cooperation commitments. Now the, the problem, as I mentioned for small businesses, especially we did a bunch of interviews of our SMEs in the region. And we found that most of them actually use bank transfers. In 2020 and 2020, 2021, most of them get paid via bank transfer, which is incredibly expensive, very challenging, very tedious, and keeps you out of the business to consumer sector entirely because no customer wants to go do a bank transfer, especially for smaller size e-commerce or digital services payments. So it's a real challenge. The bank costs attached to that are high and non-transparent. You don't know what you're going to get charged, and ultimately, often your profits get eaten up entirely by bank transactions uh, and the fees associated with that. So this is a real problem. What, what do they look like? Of course, there's a variation uh, in why this is so hard. Part of it is just unbanked populations, especially in Asia. We don't have a lot of credit cards. Uh, this is a very unusual uh, thing to have, actually, in a lot of the economies across the region. 
We have the growing use of electronic wallets. Uh, and in some markets, and again, it varies tremendously. Asia is big. <laughs> China, fantastic. You know, Lao, not so much. Uh, we have e-wallets, electronic wallets, but even e-wallets between the same companies. So my Grab wallet in Singapore will not work when I get to Thailand. I need to have a different e-Grab wallet in order to use the car sharing services from the same company in different jurisdictions. Some countries have restrictions on what fintechs can deliver. Some allow no, no fintechs at all, others allow some. And so it's very difficult uh, to figure out what that looks like. And we have increasing data movement restrictions, especially capturing financial services data. And so that makes it really hard to have payment move if it's caught up in broader restrictions on uh, financial services data or financial data in general. And data localization requirements are really hitting the payments industry hard because you have to have services in all of the data storage centers in all of the markets in which you might potentially uh, provide these services. So that's, that's a re real problem. Uh, and then the infrastructure for payments itself has its own internal problems, um, especially inconsistent requirements. Real problems for companies are the know your customer and anti-money laundering, a, a KYC AML. Uh, those rules require certain information to be shared, but the format by which you're supposed to share that information is very different, especially here in Asia. So there's a whole lot of reasons for why this is a problem. So then we said, well, what could you do just to sort of finish this up very quickly? What can you do in trade agreements in particular? So there are some commitments that could be made in trade agreements to increase the interoperability of payment systems. Almost all of them are controversial, particularly here in Asia. So you can have an adoption of open banking. Um, you know, ASEAN is apparently working on this, but even at the ASEAN level in Southeast Asia, we might possibly get a pilot project underway for open banking that might or might not cover more than one bank between two ASEAN members over the next five years. So, I mean, there's some solutions, but they're very difficult. Innovation is very hard to support for many of the governments. They're generally uncomfortable, it depend, again, it's a big place. Some are very uncomfortable about using international standards. Uh, and so they create their own and then those are interoperable. They're not interoperable with international standards. So the, the standards that are chosen for handling payments matters a lot. Um, there can be some commitments that are made on payments specifically, like pulling payments, electronic payments out from the broader financial services potentially would allow new commitments to be made perhaps in national treatment provisions. Uh, some of the data flow and data localization rules, as I mentioned earlier, are a real problem in the payment space. Uh, and then better, at the minimum, better clarity on whether payments are in or out of financial services is actually quite important because in and out of scope activities is becoming a bigger and bigger problem for businesses trying to operate and for governments trying to design consistent outcomes. Uh, and so the, the final thing I would just say is that although it's easy to discount the importance of cooperation commitments, I actually think in the payment space, in lots of digital things, but especially in payments, there is a, a need to, to include cooperation and regulatory cooperation kinds of commitments because they do drive governments to sit down together and to think about what these, these consequences are. And, and one that I didn't put in here, but I probably should have, is continuous engagement with stakeholders is vital because you can't design the right kinds of policies if you're not talking to stakeholders about what is the consequences of that. And the payments, like almost all of the cutting edge digital questions, uh, are one of those areas where government official knowledge of what happens is completely out of line often with what actually happens on the business side. And so you create regulations that either don't work, that are incredibly costly, uh, that don't solve the problem that you want or create new collateral damage in other areas. And so that continuous engagement with stakeholders is especially important in some of these fast evolving areas like fintech and financial services and payments and all, all sorts of areas. So I think that that's it for, for me right now. Um, let me stop sharing and listen to two comments from the rest of you. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot for that, Deborah. So Nikita is gonna kick off the discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. And thank you, Deborah, for a very uh, clear presentation. 
Uh, I really enjoyed reading the paper and uh, I think it provides an excellent overview of the numerous challenges faced by merchants, uh, but also a number of fascinating examples of new developments and uh, opportunities. And perhaps three key challenges I would like to comment upon with reference to the European regional experience in cross-border payments, where indeed, as you say, things are working well, but uh, definitely not perfectly. So the first uh, issue, the lack of interoperability, where the efforts have been made to increase harmonization of legal, technical and operational aspects, and also to incentivize con commitments uh, by payment schemes. And as you note in the paper, both of these uh, objectives have met further challenges and as a response and further push in these directions, digital economy agreement and digital economic partnership agreements have a dedicated chapter or section on digital payments, which include commitments to uh, to adopt uh, open banking, the facilitation of innovation and the adoption of international standards uh, like the ISO uh, or an electronic data exchange between financial institutions and service suppliers. This follows the developments in the EU where, as you know, uh, open banking has received a significant push with the revised payment services directive and facilitating of innovation and standardization are key regulatory objectives. Uh, however, um, a number of interoperability challenges persist despite these efforts, uh, both in open banking as well as in emerging innovative solutions and, and, and standards. And uh, to me, this indicates a clear need for further regulatory intervention, uh, which is not to say that uh, more rules need to be created, but rather a better targeted and uh, regulatory requirements and incentives are needed. Now, second, you underlined the challenge of the lack of access to new payment solutions and technologies for merchants in the region uh, due to the lack of availability in specific locations, uh, lack of reliability to use this uh, at scale, and also reluctance of consumers to adopt new payment solutions. So uh, all three, uh, similarly to the interoperability problem, require regulatory response uh, that is, uh, in this case, that should be a balance between the supply side and demand side challenges. And if the challenges of legal certainty, uh, barriers to entry and uh, anti-competitive behavior are common regulatory objectives, then demand side, uh, demand side or consumer centered measures are equally important uh, for any regulatory framework that aims at enhancing innovation and availability of this innovation in uh, cross-border payments for both merchants and consumers. And finally, uh, very briefly, the third, uh, and perhaps an elephant in the room whenever we talk about cross-border money transfers are concerns over money laundering and terrorism financing. And the paper touches upon, as, as, as you briefly mentioned in the presentation, uh, the lack of harmonization in uh, KYC rules and their implementation. Uh, but as the recent and rather dramatic European experience shows, the AML framework uh, shortcomings can seriously undermine corresponding bank arrangements, uh, increase the levels of the risking and impede the availability and adoption of new technologies and new business models based on innovative technologies. And, and this challenge cannot be underestimated uh, also in the context of digital trade. So these are just some very uh, brief points and I'll be very happy to discuss these at further occasions. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. So we have five minutes or so, so the floor is open. I think if you raise your hands, you'll pop up on my screen and I'll see it, but. Uh, I don't know how to raise my hand, I have some. Business. It's under reactions, click on reactions. Hmm. Bill, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for the interesting presentations. I have a question for Deborah. I'm really not sufficiently familiar with the Asia Pacific situation um, with regard to data uh, flows and, and data localization. I just haven't seen a lot of good literature on this. So I, I would, uh, could you say a little bit more for me about sort of it sounds like all these governments launched new policies with no coordination uh, and interoperability, and that, which is kind of remarkable when you're dealing with new new initiatives like this. So I'm just wondering, what is the what is the sort of kind of dialogue that's going on in Asia around these issues? Uh, which stakeholders are involved? 
In what forums are these issues being addressed? Are there, is it being dealt with totally in terms of payment specific restrictions or are, they, are payments being impacted by broader restrictions on data flows and localization? I, I don't have a, a good grasp of the feeling. I haven't seen your paper. So anything more you can tell me briefly would be really helpful. Thanks. Thanks. So before, let's just take a few and then go back to Deborah. Okay. And then, okay. uh, so Eric. Yeah, I have a, a more simple question regarding the artificial intelligence uh, topic. I mean, I, I, I understand that the presentation by Laurent was a, more from a legal perspective and policy perspective, but that's also where my question comes in. So I would like to ask to experts, what exactly is artificial intelligence related trait? Because if I read many of these documents, for example, by the new package that the European Commission has proposed, um, I see a lot of things that are potentially um, regulated. And it varies from conformity assessments to data, to IP, to all sorts of other stuff. And so that leads me to think, where are basically the flows of artificial intelligence related trade? And so far, if I'm in any kind of expert group, nobody can really tell me where the bulk of flows in terms of services, in terms of new machines that are generating this artificial intelligence kind of output in terms of personal data. Everything seems to be important, but I am sort of confused where the bulk of that kind of flow trade is. And I think that's important, especially when you want to create some kind of indexes and some kind of picture of where these potential artificial intelligence kind of trade will be inhibited. So that, that's my main question. Okay. Thanks. So two more, Gabriela and then Martina, and then we'll go back to Deborah. Uh, and I, and I think again, you know, so if you feel inspired, write it down, put it in the chat uh, so that we can keep a record as well. So Gabriela. So just as a quick comment, I don't know for Martina and Danielle, uh, you, sh you should, but maybe, I don't know, like a little face, a round face, and if you click on it, it's just down below on the right. And that, oh, okay, Martina's got the hand. No, just very quick for uh, an observation. So we're talking about payment, but in reality, I, I, I think, and I don't know, I mean, I don't have the, the, the answer. It's just a question for everybody. How should we classify these measures? Because the point is here, we're talking about trading services, but we're talking also about data localization. We're talking about uh, data related, related measures. And so one question that sort of would apply probably across the board, if we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, payment uh, services, whatever, is what is the criterion to classify these measures? So should we put them in different uh, classes? Should we try to focus on one class? And because maybe one classification has different implications for from another one. And um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so that's really one of the things the whole project is going to be trying to do. Martina. Uh, yes, exactly. So this is what we, we will think about in the, in the seminar. We're going to have a seminar only about how to uh, address and, uh, and, 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 and try to uh, create a methodology around these types of, uh, of measures. And so far in the past index we have uh, made uh, related to digital trade, we had one section on cross-border data flows and there we also put restrictions on uh, uh, payments, for example, on, uh, on consumer data for financial sector or other types of restrictions uh, related to uh, data flows. And then in the section on online transactions, we put all other types of restrictions such as uh, restrictions on the possibility to use certain types of credit cards or restrictions on cryptocurrencies. So th there is quite uh, quite a lot of things uh, to to think about. And I just wanted to add um, to add this point on on Deborah, Deborah's presentation. And I think on top of what uh, we already had identified as uh, possible restrictions, uh, this issue about the uh, know your customer and the anti money laundering is very interesting. And also the uh, issue or the the proposal to have uh, uh, ISO. Uh, that countries should adopt and, and follow is very interesting. So it's definitely something we should take into account in the methodology. Okay, thanks. Deborah, you want to come back? Uh, I think we're Eric. I think in terms of Eric's I'll question, skip let's Eric. No, no, Eric. <laughs> skip let's park Eric. let's park your question <laughs> for the last for the last session where we revert back to this AI, right? So 
Temper. Okay, so let me let me start briefly with with Bill's comments. You know, one of the things that is striking about Asia compared to Europe and North America is the lack of institutionalization in the region. We just don't have, in general, places that discuss stuff. <laughs> we don't really do policy in different in groups. We don't have we don't have companies who are lobbyists. We don't have think tanks. We don't have you know. We, there's so many things we do not have. So that makes it very difficult to figure out how do you align in different areas. What we do have that that starts to underpin some of this is ASEAN itself. So Southeast Asia, the 10 countries, they do have an institution. It doesn't work particularly well. It's very complicated and cumbersome, but at least they meet all the time. So that helps develop some sorts of consistent policies. We have the new creation of RCEP. So this is all 15 markets in the region that will also start to create some platform for conversations. I think that's actually quite useful. We have APEC, which does some of the conversations part, but they don't actually deliver much. It's all voluntary and about cooperative behavior and whatever. So we don't have the institutional mechanisms that you might expect in place to decide on what kinds of policies make sense? What are challenges? How do we align around them is actually really a problem. And, that, and that's, I think, reflected in so many areas in trade in the region anyways. It's just this lack of alignment. Places to even places to align, places to have a conversation about potential alignment or misalignment it just doesn't happen. Um, and you can see this in so many areas. And so I was just thinking about the classification challenges. I mean, classifying data is something that ASEAN has tried to do. So they actually had this long running thing where they were gonna classify data. And at the end of it, they had like 47 different categories of data. And these high ones could not go and low ones can go. And I mean, it's when you look at it, you think there is no business that will ever move a piece of data around the region because it is so complicated, the classification schemes. And so one of the things that we're about to work on, which I think is a good one, is the sort of in and out of scope coverage for some of the pieces of legislation that we're getting. I mean, I, this doesn't really help you in a way, but maybe it does. Uh, to think about what kinds of e-commerce transactions are in and out. Does it cover online advertising, paid online advertising? Is it is it this or that? You know, just to get some sense of what the the parameters are, because again, we don't have a platform for this conversation. And so what happens is a government creates a rule, creates a regulation, creates a piece of legislation. They have no idea that it doesn't work. And they certainly have no idea that it doesn't align with anyone else's or is, is, is opposite someone else's. And you end up with a regulatory mess. And it's a real problem, especially in the digital space where we have governments that honest to God have no idea how information moves at all in the first place. And so then you end up compounding the challenges. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Deborah. So it sounds to me this is kind of a perfect encapsulation of what we're trying to do and why it's valuable to do this mapping exercise. So even though we can't probably be a platform ourselves, I mean, putting that information together is clearly something that you, know, you need to start. You need to start with that. So that's certainly something that uh, kind of is on the agenda very much. OK, let's <coughs> let's move on to another small topic which is uh, content access restrictions. Um, and we're gonna be kicking off with uh, Daniele Flunk, who is going to open it up this discussion. Yes, thank you. I'll share my screen. Just a sec. Okay, can you see this? That's good. Okay, yeah, so hi, I'm Danielle Blanc. Um, I'm a research associate and PhD candidate at the Hurdy School. Uh, I'm affiliated with the Jacques Delors Center, but also the Center for Digital Governance. And today I'm gonna uh, have a very short discussion about content control and how we can think about content control as a digital trade restriction. Okay, so I will start with the definition. So basically I define content control or like content access restriction as the process by which actors with a given identity use different technologies, policies, and justifications to influence or limit access to internet content for a given purpose. Um, and I think we can see content control as a trade restriction kind of as a subset of this broader definition, 
um, which then would be the process by which governments use different technologies, policies, and justifications to influence or limit access to internet content for economic purposes. So here we see that governments should be the central actors and that the, the purpose should be economic or trade related, right? And I think a prime example of this is geoblocking. And I think we all know this example as uh, so a geo blocking can basically be used to restrict access to content and most notably in the area of online distribution of movies and music. Um, so copyright owners can basically wall off their content from people in different jurisdictions. So the purpose of geo blocking is basically the protection of copyright holders in a specific country or region. And this allows, of course, for price discrimination across countries and regions. Um, when it comes down to content controls and digital trade restriction and how to identify that, I think there are basically three challenges. Um, so first, there's this inherent friction and overlap between the purposes for content control. So it can be difficult to determine whether certain content regulation is solely for like an economic purpose or a trade purpose, or it might be for a political purpose, right? It could be about the, the uh, suppressing dissent, for instance, or a protest, things like that. Um, and there might, of course, be overlap in these purposes. Um, a certain policy might have several purposes. And the second challenge is that there's an inherent friction between the purpose of content regulation on the one hand and the frames and justifications that uh, governments used uh, to legitimize such regulation. So even though a government might frame a policy as an economic policy, um, the actual purpose might have been political. And then the third challenge, I think, is that there's a friction between the purpose and the effects of content regulation. So even though the purpose of a regulation might be uh, to limit political content, the effects might actually be a detriment to uh, trade, right? So I think these are the three challenges. And then uh, Martina asks us to um, think a bit about the uh, content control uh, or like the trade restrictions related to the WTO joint statement and initiative negotiations. Um, and I think here, the content control as a digital trade restriction is kind of cross cutting among several issues. And I think this ties in very well what we just discussed, right? Like, where do you draw the line? When is it one topic and when is it the other? Um, so there's some, several issues and sub issues currently being discussed at the joint statement and initiative negotiations. And I think a number of broader themes involve content control, namely openness and e-commerce, uh, but also internet and data access. Then there's a number of small groups discussing specific sub-issues. And also those are a number of which are, of those are also related to content control. So there's spam, there's open access, there's open government data. Um, so I think there, these are the several relevant topics uh, related to this like broader umbrella topic. Um, and then I think specifically to these negotiations, there's two broader obstacles. So first, the issues under discussion are often complex and technical, so that really limits certain members to effectively engage in discussions. And then the other point is that member positions with regard to content control and the openness of the internet more broadly vary significantly, and this makes it really challenging to reach agreement uh, among these actors. So we see that liberal countries take on a more human rights centered position in internet governance debates uh, than authoritarian countries. But also within the liberal country coalition, there's disagreement to the extent of this approach. So the EU member states often emphasize the role of the state in protecting human rights. And the US, of course, promotes a free flow of information uh, for business purposes. And then there's a group of developing countries that criticize new rules on data flows, technology transfers, and uh, the disclosure of source code, which of course could constrain their domestic policies and their, ambi their uh, ambitious to um, their abilities to industrialize. Um, so there are these areas where there's significant process such as spam, uh, but it's often more challenging for countries to agree over these very core principles, such as the openness of the internet, free flow of information. Okay, so this is my very brief overview of content control as a trade restriction. And I think many things remain open-ended from my side, uh, but I think especially important for this research project is the question on how to conceptualize and identify content control as a trade restriction. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. Thank you. Great, thanks. Well, you have two discussions, so <laughs> let's start with um, Andrea. 
Hi, hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, just a short introduction to myself. Um, I'm Andrea Calderaro, senior lecturer at Cardiff University, but I'm on leave from Cardiff and I'm based at the European University Institute at the, here at the Schumann Center. So, um, yeah, I mean, in very few minutes, I mean, also because Stefan, I'm sure, has many other things to add. Uh, I think uh, you, I mean, also based on the paper that I, that I went through, the, you do a good, uh, it's a good start to, to start looking at mapping on which techniques and methods are usually used to, to manage, uh, to restrict uh, control access to, to information. Another layer of research that I would recommend you to engage with is to map actors um, in addition to practice, because usually practice are, well, each actors do have different methods. They uh, do have different tools that they can uh, uh, use in order to, 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 to manage, to restrict uh, access to, to, to information. And especially because you have a slightly kind of interest uh, in, uh, in, in the human rights dimension of access control that, that would also I understand from the paper and from the short introduction uh, of, the, of the research here. And when it comes to, uh, to human rights, or well, actually when it comes to the restriction of uh, access to, to information online, usually it, that issues quickly falls in the domain of security as well, uh, especially when it comes to authoritarian regime. And then when it comes to, the, we're going to start using the magic word security, everything is allowed, which is highly problematic. And that makes it uh, uh, even more complicated to map, uh, to understand who's responsible for what. Um, WTO usually does not deal with security, but whatever they do, as you rightfully say, has a clear impact on security related issues. A good example is, uh, um, yeah, the classic example and, uh, is the contradiction that exists in any country, especially in authoritarian regime, between telecom laws and cybercrime laws. So the telecom laws are a set of regulations and policies that give the impression that everything is possible, that telecom operators are supposed to, 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 to sell their products freely. They are there because the citizens are, are protected. Also, telecom laws are the, the piece of legislation where you usually could find uh, what contents could be uh, easily accessible, how data or customers are usually, and how the, those data are, are protected. So most of the times, telecom laws are good. The problem is, is are the cybercrime laws because cybercrime laws is where uh, everything is actually forbidden and is where uh, the, the, they're gonna say, yeah, telecom law says that companies could do whatever they want, that citizens are protected, but as far as they don't break something, some piece of laws and comes with the, uh, whether, um, well, in authoritarian regime, we usually also to say something against, uh, um, I don't know, I mean, you've been working in Myanmar, as soon as you say something against them, that, then you, you go in jail right away. And that is, uh, is, is something that usually happens. So all these kind of examples to say, do more in mapping uh, the uh, overlapping responsibilities among actors in order to do that, you need to, uh, to, to map actors and how the, those responsibilities are, are split among those actors and whether there is an overlap or contradictory uh, regulations in uh, each country. That's all. Great. Thanks a lot. Stefan? Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the paper. I particularly like the way you teased out the uh, frictions between purposes and effects and also in the entanglements of uh, the political and the economic. So my first thought of that, and again, coming again from a, also from a human rights perspective, is that we do have a bit of a literature on how to uh, disentangle these things, which is a literature on proportionality of restrictions. And you can map that a bit both on the economic and political dimension, because you know, in a political dimension, you'd have, well, you know, restrictions of speech should be necessary and tailored, et cetera, et cetera. And then when that comes to legislation, um, 
I think it, it would be a good idea to map that discussion on um, this notion of the technical stack of the internet. So are, the, are any restrictions going to the content layer to the actual platform? You know, is it a, you know, telling platforms to take one tweet or one Facebook post down, or does it go deeper into infrastructural layers? And are we talking, you know, internet shutdowns? And I, it would seem that this kind of analysis would tell you at some point, well, something about the capabilities of the state, but also something about whether or not they're trying to achieve political purposes or economic purposes, depending on where they go in the, in the stack. Uh, the other point that I wanted to bring was, um, well, the, essentially the reverse of the geo-blocking discussion, which is the uh, uh, sort of territorial effect of legal orders regarding content and, and the extraterritorial effect of uh, you know, when the Austrian courts say, take this piece of uh, content down because it's defamatory, how does that actually apply, you know, in the entirety of the EU? So, and then there was a third element, which I'm not sure is all that important, but a lot, of, like there's a distinction between content and behavior. So do you have restrictions which, I mean, I guess fall under content in the sense that, you know, a government tries to prevent people from uh, talking to each other in order to organize a demonstration and whatnot. But like the purpose of the restriction is more the behavior rather than any particular piece of content, but this should still be captured somehow. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So the floor is open. I before while you're thinking, I have one kind of thought on on, on this because clearly a lot of these issues are overlapping, right? So I think a lot of the discussion on this has been on the political human rights side of the equation. Obviously, there's a big economic rent dimension which is associated with intellectual property rights, but I think there's also a consumer protection dimension which is more focused on regulation. And you know, so I'm a Dutch guy living in Italy who doesn't speak Italian very well. And one of the things that drives me crazy is European regulation, which requires everything to be in Italian, right? So if I go and I need to have maintenance done on my Lenovo laptop, <clears throat> you know, Lenovo will automatically send me to an Italian website and will not give me access to anything in English. So this is the type of craziness that we also run into which in a sense is also, you could say, this is also potentially the limiting access to content. So I think one of the challenges is to divide these things up into buckets um, so that we can actually look at where, where, where things are uh, overlapping. Martina. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment on, uh, on this proportionality and the where to find uh, uh, the border between what is a restriction and what is not. Um, I think uh, instead of focusing on, on what is the intent, which can be political or not, I'd focus on the effect. So if the effect is uh, eliminating a post of a person, this does not have any economic impact on the, on the company uh, in general, if it's a few posts or it's a filtering of some information. But if instead you are acting at the infrastructure level and you are blocking the access to a certain website, then it becomes a trade uh, problem. So I think uh, we can think uh, around those lines. Then it's still hard to find to to, to identify what is a lot of posts being blocked, and, and then uh, that means in practice, then this yeah, then the, the social media or or the blog is not working in practice. Um, yeah, so we would we have to think about it. And another thing which uh, also. Uh, had me thinking when we were discussing uh, and addressing this topic uh, in the past was uh, the issue on IP uh, when it is okay to ask uh, platforms to block certain um, certain IP infringing uh, content when it's uh, too much when it becomes uh, too costly for, for, for the platform to, to conduct this so this is another thing we I think we have to discuss and this goes also into the intermediate liability discussion so but just some more questions and thoughts. Thanks, Bill. Hi, I just wanted to pick up, I, again, I haven't seen the paper, but I wanted to pick up on the point that Stefan flagged. Um, I'm curious uh, to hear any thoughts about the extent to which what you're seeing is a broader trend towards weaponizing the underlying infrastructure of the internet versus uh, targeting 
uh, specific uh, content uh, through more bounded kind of means. Because it, what I see go, look, looking around is more and more uh, governments trying to do things that impact the architecture of the domain names, the way the domain name system works, the way interoperability between um, autonomous systems that are transiting traffic works and all these kinds of questions. So, and this has real significant implications for, you know, internet fragmentation for the larger architecture of the underlying global digital economy. So I'm just curious if you could address that dimension specifically. Is that something that you're seeing as a sort of secular trend on the increase in the work that you're doing? Thanks. Great, thank you. Gabriele? Um, very briefly, so I'm not sure whether this was already under the radar of Danielle, but I think it may be important to look at specifically at geoblocking, but maybe this could apply also to other content controls. Geoblocking and eliminating geoblocking, as well as a trade barrier, because the US Chamber of Commerce, and I remember also there was a paper of the US Congressional Service that was very concerned that these allowing certain business practices would be a trade barrier. So not simply geo-blocking as a problem, but also disallowing it because this would have an impact of, on businesses that are practicing geo-blocking. So from the US perspective in this case. So I think maybe the, both sides of the coin should be looked at. And I don't know if this wasn't in the radar already. Thanks, Stefan. Right. So on one hand, I do think there's a general trend of government sort of getting better at going after content they dislike as opposed to, you know, entire services or uh, shutting down the internet in general. So there's definitely a learning curve there and more and more governments seem to be able to do this uh, precisely, so to say. Um, the other thing which I do think is also happening and I think is maybe more worrisome is this intertwining of sort of politics and economics that we used to see in the media sector. So, you know, you'd have like a TV station that was close to the government and that would get better terms. And we're starting to see that with platforms. So like we're starting to see in some places, you know, alternatives to Twitter and to Facebook that are homegrown and sort of in bed with the local government and get preferential treatment to some extent, whereas the, uh, the government goes after the foreign uh, platforms. Thanks. So Danielle, some reactions and then we'll... Yes, I will very briefly re react. I'm sorry if I can't respond to all of you. Um, Andrea, I think securitization is a big issue here. And I think this is also about like the frames and justification side of things, right? So you see increasingly that governments just put a security frame on like on top of a policy and then basically um, it legitimizes like content co control regardless of what the underlying purpose is. So I do think that, and I think this is what makes this area so blurry, but also super interesting. Um, yes, yeah, Stefan, thank you for that suggestion about the proportionality restrictions. I'll take that just like up as a comment. Um, Martina, uh, we can discuss about later. Martina, okay, so just looking at the effect, that's still tricky, right? Because you can say, okay, like content removal is just like, just like removal of a post, it's just removal of a post. But what if we remove somebody who's doing all their business online, right? Then, yeah, of course, the impact might be less heavy than a complete internet shutdown, but like, how do you grade that, right, relatively? And how do you determine if that, like, effect was solely economic or there were also other impacts and what are the long-term impacts of this? So I think you can be pragmatic and say, okay, we only look at the effects, but then there's still a difference in effects. So I think it doesn't solve our, all of our problems here. Um, but we, we, yeah, we, we can try it. We can... Check it out. Um, Bill, also very briefly. So I'm not too much on the technical, like on the infrastructure side of things, but I do agree with Stefan that content control is getting more sophisticated. So if you, for instance, look at internet shutdowns, that it used to be that there was a complete shutdown and there was a lot of backlash, and that now what governments do is just throttle the internet, right? 
so that they slow internet speed so people cannot upload pictures, for instance. Uh, so I do think indeed that in this area, it's getting more sophisticated, but I also think measuring this is super complicated. And then if we can measure it, we can compare it and we can look at trends. Um, and that's always a tricky issue, but it's interesting because we always thought, okay, we go from very basic techniques such as shutdowns to like more broader policies to broader norms, stuff like that. But we now also see that as the technical layers, things are getting more and more sophisticated from the government side. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you all for the comments. Um, we have a lot to think about, I think. Okay, thanks. No, I think that is something also for us to think about in terms of the measurement I mentioned of this whole project, because obviously most of the focus is actually on legislation, regulation, policies, but here we're talking about what governments actually do, right? So to have some measure of, I don't know, activism, you know, it, 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 is there a way of thinking about how can we actually capture some of this, which is comparable across countries so that you at least get a sense of what's the first order magnitude of what we see in different jurisdictions in terms of call it enforcement, call it activism, whatever. But I think that is something for us to collectively um, think about. Okay, we were supposed to have a break, which we have eaten up. And I think if anybody needs a break, just feel free to switch off your screen. Um, uh, Bernard, for a few minutes. sorry for uh, um, yeah, interrupting again. I think we can get a break now because now the stress about being on time is over in terms of people who had to leave. So if uh, you feel like we can take a couple of minutes, uh, up to you. This I'm just uh, telling you that uh, we like the, the first three had to be super on time. We now have a few minutes flexibility from now until the end. Okay, so no more discipline. This is this is a bad message to give. Actually, <laughs> I don't know what people. I think you know we do this all the time. Um, so and it was only five minutes. So I suggest we just keep on going. Um, so Martina, why don't you just you know, yes. go, go ahead, go ahead. And, and then I will yeah. still be on time. I will uh, not uh, take uh, advantage of the fact that we are now not uh, in a hurry. So let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, my topic is uh, cross-border data flows, which is an issue I've been working on uh, for the past maybe six, seven years. Um, so, um, uh, well, when we talk about pol data policies in general, we really have kind of two types of measures. On one hand, you have the domestic policies, so we, and in terms of uh, uh, trade restrictions, we can consider the lack of data protection law to be a problem for trade, data retention rules, which can be a cost, uh, the requirements to have a DPO or a DPIA, or a data protection impact assessment, or cases in which the government is, uh, has uh, the right to access data without any court ruling. Uh, these are all types of measures which can, con can be considered domestic policies, which apply uh, both to foreign companies and domestic companies. And this is not part of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to focus on the cross-border policies. Um, and uh, when it comes to cross-border policies, um, I have uh, uh, thought about this and uh, a few years ago uh, I wrote a taxonomy because uh, I was very annoyed uh, by the fact that people are calling things in, same things in different ways. So I decided I'm going to, oh, you always call them in, in this way using this taxonomy. And uh, um, so uh, in general, we can identify uh, four types of restrictions that apply uh, on uh, data flowing across borders. Uh, you have local storage requirements, which uh, are those requirements in which the company has to keep a copy of data locally. Uh, for example, for um, for law, for investigations, for example, financial uh, institutions have to keep a copy of accounting data locally. Um, then uh, there is a local processing requirement, which is the requirement to process data locally, so to use local data centers. Um, and only after data is processed locally, then it can be transferred abroad. This is the case of Russia for personal data, for example. Then there are cases of complete bans to transfer data. This is very rare and very uh, um, 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 usually limited to a specific set of data, which could be health data in Australia, for example. In these cases, the data not only has to be processed locally, but also cannot be transferred. Even a copy of the data cannot be transferred abroad. 
And then you have the conditional flow regime. Uh, this is how I call the EU approach, which is an approach in which uh, only if certain conditions are fulfilled, data can be transferred abroad. So, abroad. so if uh, the conditions are fulfilled, there are no restrictions. If they're not, then there's a ban to transfer those data. So based on this uh, uh, sort of taxonomy, um, uh, I was looking at uh, how many measures uh, have been applied, which uh, uh, belong to these four categories. And we, we do see a huge increase in the number of measures being implemented uh, over the past years. And uh, these measures um, are mostly horizontal. So they apply to all sectors. Uh, we have over 50% of those measures. And uh, when we look at the uh, type of data they are covering, uh, they mostly apply to personal data. So a measure can be um, horizontal uh, or can be sectoral, but apply to personal data. It could be a, per a measure, for example, applying to the health tech sector, but then uh, covering only personal data within the health sector, or a measure could be covering all data within a sector. So there is this kind of uh, uh, different uh, 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 yeah, categorization you can do on, on, on types of data. Uh, but generally, we have horizontal measures applying to personal data. So the first question I have, which uh, is going to be something we, we are going to discuss during this project, is uh, uh, how do these measures impact digital trade? And, and this is actually uh, the, the only question to which we sort of have an answer already, thanks to some uh, studies we have done with Eric. Uh, uh, what we did is to use the, the data we collected uh, through a project we worked on, create an index of uh, data policies, and we did an, economic, an econometric analysis to look at whether these measures have an impact on trading services. And what we found in two papers, which are published in uh, two journals, are uh, is that, that uh, first of all, the um, measures which apply ed, uh, cross-border, um, so all the measures I spoke about before, seem to have an impact on trading services. So when countries have strict restrictions, uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on data flows, on average, they uh, import less uh, services. And then what we find, found is also that the domestic policies tend to have an impact on productivity, while uh, the cross-border uh, measures do not seem to have a strong impact on uh, productivity of domestic firms. Also, what we did very recently uh, was to um, look into uh, personal uh, data policies we divided the world into three group, uh, groups of countries, countries that have no restrictions on the movement of personal data, countries which have conditions like the EU approach, and then countries which have strong uh, restrictions like the China approach. So this is like the US approach, the EU approach, and the China approach. Uh, we have mapped countries across the world. We have looked at 116 countries. And based on, on this uh, on, um, uh, gravity uh, model that Eric uh, worked on, uh, what we found is that uh, countries which have an open transfer, so no restrictions on the cross-border movement of data, tend to have higher trade with each other, while countries having the China approach, which with strict um, measures um, on, uh, when it comes to uh, movement of data, have less trade in services with each other. And then countries having the EU approach, the conditions tend to have uh, more trade in certain sectors and less in others. So the, the, the impact there on trade is more ambiguous. So uh, in general, it seems that there is an impact on, uh, on trading services of these measures. And also this is supported by the fact that all companies are basically complaining about restrictions on data, on data uh, flows. Then, uh, and the next question is what weight, uh, which weights do we assign to these different types of measures? Uh, so is a local processing requirement stricter than a ban to transfer on, trade, on trading services? Is a local storage requirement, so the requirement only to keep a copy of certain data more problematic than a conditional flow regime? So this is something that I would like to discuss and perhaps we can also invite companies to join and, uh, and tell us what they think about this. But so far, this is still like an open question uh, for me. Another question I have is, um, in general, what can be considered to be a best practice when we take into account all those policy objectives that countries uh, think that they are achieving with these restrictions, uh, which, are, which are long, um, uh, cover privacy, security, law enforcement. Um, and I think still at the global level, we don't have clear best practices on uh, 
what measures uh, can help to achieve those policy objectives and which instead are completely irrelevant and only uh, in practice uh, create restrictions on trade without achieving any of these policy objectives. And finally, another open question is uh, how do we uh, go about all these bilateral, plurilateral, sectoral commitments on the free flow of data? We have a, a lot of those and so far in all the studies we have done uh, also with Eric, we have never taken into account uh, those. We are starting now um, uh, a paper on uh, the adequacy to see if adequacy does have an impact on trading services. Uh, but still, we have uh, uh, we are starting to see agreements like the CPTPP, which was the first one where you have a commitment for free flow of data, but also very uh, wide uh, carve outs and exceptions. Uh, and then you have all these agreements, uh, arrangements like the APEC, which uh, however is voluntary. We have the OECD privacy principles, all the adequacy decisions, uh, privacy shield, which now is not there anymore, uh, convention 108, and then all the sectoral arrangements in the specific sectors. So this is another thing which I think we need to think about and discuss in, on, and, and decide whether we want to include this in our methodology or just keep all these sectoral, bilateral, plurilateral um, commitments out from our analysis. That's it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Martina. So, Bill, over to you. Okay, um, thanks, Martina. That was interesting as always. Uh, I guess I'll make three points real quickly in two minutes. Uh, uh, first, on the, the general point, uh, you know, about the need for better uh, data uh, that's more differentiated and so on. Uh, there's some real challenges here. I mean, first of all, just to take your slide uh, with the taxonomy, I mean, that could be built out and complexified quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot of uh, variations in terms of uh, governments that where there's a strong uh, localization requirement but no fl uh, flow restrictions or local storage requirements that involve processing or don't involve processing or so on and so forth. There are restrictions involving, you know, use of uh, national technical standards and disclosure of source code, things like that. There's uh, bans can be total or selective. Uh, you know, the Biden administration recently adopted an executive order uh, that targets really uh, data flows to China uh, in particular. Uh, um, and that's uh, quite an interesting trend. Uh, but there's a lot of other complications as well. And you're familiar with all these. I mean, just to, to know, like governmental data uh, often is localized in, by requirement. And we never talk about that. That's not captured in a lot of the discussions. But even countries you would list as an open flow country like the US, they have all kinds of limitations on state information and where it can be hosted and where it can flow, et cetera. Uh, a lot of policies are ad hoc and piecemeal, short term versus being part of an overarching strategy and sustained. Sometimes the uh, restrictions are adopted kind of sotto voce and negotiated bilaterally with companies uh, kind of in a way that is not easy to get transparency into. Um, a lot of times companies don't want to talk about the, the flow restrictions that they face or the deals that they're making with governments. So there've been a lot of cases where governments uh, have made concessions to allow flow that was very limited, et cetera. And this is not like publicly shared. We don't have a lot of good information about the impacts beyond transnational firms on MSMEs and NGOs or on non-economic uh, aspects like human rights. So, uh, you know, absent better data, I think that uh, you know a lot of the the work. There's so much literature on data flows that's kind of shallow and repeating the same cases over and over. And then just because I'm running out of time, two very quick points. I think that we really need, and you're contributing to this, to form some kind of an epistemic community of people who are specialized around uh, questions of data flow. Um, this overlaps with digital trade, but it's not entirely uh, a digital trade issue. There's a lot of aspects that go beyond trade. Epistemic communities uh, played a lot of important roles in previous uh, struggles over data flows in the 80s and 90s and fed into the trade and services negotiations and made meaningful contributions to government's work. And I think that forming some sort of coherent uh, grouping uh, that has sustained dialogue would be really, really helpful. And we need more structured multi-track 
kind of approaches uh, because the trade people are not going to open up their processes. And yet there's a lot of uh, need for greater expertise in a lot of the discussions as demonstrated in the JSI. So that's why I wrote this paper you've seen for WEF on um, the need for you know having multi-stakeholder dialogue and making better use of non-binding intergovernmental agreements and so on as ways to try and feed into some of these processes. I think we have to figure out how to take these things forward because particularly when you're dealing with something like you know all the language that's in all the trade agreements about uh, uh, you know governments can um, have uh, a legitimate public policy objectives, um, but they're they should not uh, engage in arbitrary and unjustifiable discrimination or disguised restrictions or have policies that are more restrictive than necessary. Are these issues that we really want to try to solve just by going through the dispute resolution system if it ever is working again? Or do we want to have broader dialogues that can help to feed into the discussions in a more meaningful way and engage stakeholders? So there's a lot to do. I went over my time, sorry. Um, but so I'll stop there. But I think there's a lot to talk about. Thanks, Bill. Very, uh, very useful comments. So, Maria, before we open it up. Yeah, thank you. Hi, from my side as well. And as as Bill ended, like there are many issues about this topic. And one of the things I would like to mention about the data restrictions, and I know that you've also done some research on that, Martina, but that with data restrictions, countries do have the right to still um, protect privacy, security, et cetera, as the, the WTO rules allow them to do that. However, there are several issues with that, that now we have the e-commerce talks at the WTO, but it's not really discussed how the, the international regulations that are currently in place are actually also regulating data flows. So to what extent can the GATS cover the, the general agreement on uh, on trading services can cover also data. So I think this is one of the issues that has to be addressed. Uh, then as, as the policies are very different uh, in, in every country, um, then as you said, we do need to have some best practices. And, and as even though countries do have the right to, to protect privacy and security, they only have the right to do it to a certain extent. And therefore, like what I'm also doing in my research, and I think it's not really uh, that the current policies are really in accordance with the rules that are in place on the international trade level. So, uh, so what, like one of the questions is what could be done to lower the level of restrictions on digital trade? Um, and I mean, especially let's always keep in mind also the, the SMEs because uh, I know like one of the solutions that has been offered is to think maybe there's also some sort of a technolo uh, technological solution to, to help to protect the privacy. However, this most likely will not be a solution for SMEs. And also as in the GATS, uh, in the WTO framework, and also as I'm, I'm, I'm researching the adequacy decisions of the, the EU and how this the system functions in, in, in international trade law and, and how this system could be used uh, uh, maybe as a plurilateral agreement, then um, it's, yeah, what can be changed on the regulatory level so it would be easier? I think that's the one of the, the first questions. And, and can the technolo technological side even be part of it because the WTO and also the EU is mentioning the technology uh, neutrality and is it then even possible to include this? So these are the comments from my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So let's open it up um, for discussion. I, I think just to pick up on Bill's comment on an epistemic community, I think that is very much in in our heads, right? And I think one of the things <coughs> that the EUI does is actually act as a platform um, for communities in other areas, right? So we have the Florence School of Regulation, which is really doing that. So I think that's certainly one of the things we, we should be thinking about uh, looking forward. Are there any comments, questions, reactions? 
let me just say two things that came to mind as, as, as the discussion was ongoing. So one is a bit economic in the sense that if you look at all these objection, these objectives that uh, Martina laid out in one of her slides, right? So one of Jan Tinbergen's famous propositions is that we really should have one objective tied to one instrument, right? And as soon as you start having one instrument, which is supposed to be pursuing, you know, multiple objectives, you very quickly run into inefficiency. So maybe that's one of the things we, we should also be thinking about in terms of if we map these different goals and objectives to get a sense of, okay, what type of policy instrument is really most suited to actually pursue that objective and which is clearly, you know, less, less effective, less efficient. The other thing that occurred to me, <coughs> and that maybe we can also talk about more generally, is obviously there's a lot of information sitting in firms, right? And some of these questions, as Bill also mentioned, you know, it gets very complicated fast. But in order to expand kind of our sense of what's most important, what's going on, and I don't know whether we've talked about this to date, but, but obviously one of the things we could do is start running surveys. Right, so if we can if we can identify what the relevant sampling frame is, what the population is, uh, to see whether we can actually expand on our kind of sense of what's actually more or less important, you know. So Martina's waiting uh, challenge is, you know, that's one way of doing that. Now I know that in the OECD with the STRI exercise, it's very much focused on expert opinion. Um, I don't think they really run much in the way of surveys, but I think that is something we can certainly consider doing, right? So that's, again, that's just for discussion. So I see Bill has his hand raised. So Bill, why don't you go ahead? Just a real quick uh, response to what you suggested, which is a, is a good one, but um, I, I ran a, a couple year process for World Economic Forum on uh, data localization and uh, data flows. And I asked a number of the corporate people uh, would you would you think that doing a survey would be one way of some, unearthing some of this needed information to take uh, stock of these things? And everybody was very reluctant to make any commitment to do anything like that, even if it was anonymized and so on, because they're always afraid that the more you talk about a case, the more people can identify that it's you, <laughs> your case that, you know, I mean, if, if you're a MasterCard in Turkey and you're having a fight, a fight with the government, everybody's going to be able to tell that that's who is responding. And so, and they really don't want to do that. This is the problem. You know, they, they want think tanks and academics and others to support the argument that data localization and restrictions are bad things, but at the same time, they don't want to divulge uh, sensitive information that would put them in an awkward position with the government. So it's, this is a real hard nut to crack, I think. Absolutely. Yes. No, I've also uh, been involved in these types of exercises, but I think, so that's partly a function of how you frame questions. It's also a function of population, you know, who, who are you sampling? Um, so clearly, you know, there are very large exercises that do this, you know, like the World Bank Enterprise Surveys, which ask all kinds of questions from hundreds of thousands of firms. So, but again, I think it is something that we should think about in terms of how do you get around this? This so for the firms, it's on the one hand competition. They're worried about what the competition might do if they know what they're doing. But mostly, it's about the governments and what what um, being identified. So that obviously will um, this is something you can deal with through anonymization. But again, the this, this the survey instrument is also going to be quite important. Like you don't ask things that are very specific to a particular type of activity where we know there are only two or three companies doing it. Okay, Deborah and Jane. Deborah. Just a couple of quick reactions. I saw Bill just wrote in to say that he'd like a survey of small businesses. That'd be great. But I will say that if you ask a small business, do you have cross-border data flow restrictions? Do they affect your business or do you have data localization requirements that affect your business? Small businesses, at least that I deal with, would look at you blankly and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so if you're going to ask small businesses for help on this, you have to frame it in a way that makes sense to them. And it, the questions need to be much more about, like, you know, have you tried to get information and had it not work? And then why? You know, so it has to be really much more carefully targeted. And I'm not sure that the small businesses who do suffer from 
restrictions on data flows and restrictions on localization will be aware that that's the problem. So th that's the downside of interviewing small businesses. Again, we do it all the time, it's fantastic, but you have to be very careful about how you use that information. And I would say one of the ways in which we get a lot of localization and restrictions in this part of the world is sector specific or context specific. So it's not like there's a blanket rule that says such and such, but it's really very, it's often very targeted and it's often, even the folks who are imposing it may not realize that it's a data flow restriction. They just sort of declare that this is the policy and then the other side has no idea, other agencies or ministries have no idea what just happened. And so even within one particular government, it's very hard to track what are the restrictions on information in a cross-border setting that apply and what are the rules on localization that might or might not apply because they can often be very, very specific. Thanks. So I think the point on asking the right question is extremely important, right? So if we go down this route, uh, that also is going to be requiring a lot of thought. Jane. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking my way through this, but going back to our opening session where we talked about the, the difficulty of uh, one not being too normative, on the other hand, trying to come up with best practice, a kind of this impossible um, set of objectives um, in how we go about this work. And um, it, I, want to, I want to respond to something Martina said, because I actually think um, it's very important in getting this balance right. And that was the reference to CPTPP and what you described as a very broad carve out. Now, on your previous uh, slide, you had shown um, exactly the list of the legitimate public policy objectives, if you like. Um, now, if we're going to say something is very broad, we better have something to compare that with and know what less broad means and what more broad means before we use the language that our trade negotiators are using. Uh, uh, do we actually know what it means? I mean, Bill made this point. He, he reminded us all that it's, yeah, but subject to um, consistency with the GATS and non-discriminatory and um, no more trade restricted than necessary to meet the LPPO. And, and I guess um, what, what I want to say is, um, I mean, I, you know, let me ask you, Martina, let's, uh, let's take GDPR. Would it pass that test in CPTPP? Is it consistent with the GATS? Is it non-discriminatory? Is it no more trade restrictive than necessary? And if it is, uh, then why does the European Commission not like it? Or, or does it fail that test, in which case the carve out isn't broad enough? I mean, I just think we have to be very careful about saying that something is or isn't a broad carve out until we have a comparison we can make with something that's more and something that's less. Because, you know, precisely uh, we're dealing here with, with the issues that are on the negotiating agenda. And I think we have to be a little bit careful. Okay, so we're running out of time. So let's move to the last um, session on uh, intermediary liability. Uh, Agnieszka is gonna kick us off. Thank you very and much. Before we do, Martina or Mia, I've tried to copy the chat, which doesn't work, but I assume there's some way of saving the chat and uh, sending it around to everybody after we're done. Yeah, that's, yes, it that's should can save itself. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, Agne, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Agnieszka and I'm a Max Weber Fellow at the UI, like Martina. I've been involved in this kickoff meeting quite late, so sorry for, for <laughs> maybe not sharing enough materials beforehand. And I also have to make a small disclosure here. Uh, I'm not a trade lawyer, I actually come from consumer protection law. And uh, from that perspective, I've been looking at, at platform liability and also generally platform regulation. So, um, for me, this has been also a very interesting event today to, to also look at those same problems. From, from a trade 
uh, perspective. So my goal for today, also considering the time is running out, is more of a, like a st stock taking and, and organizing the discussions here. And um, as, as a person who's been working especially on, on EU law, um, it, is, it is a clear trend in these days to see that EU is increasingly looking in uh, regulating platforms and and uh, and this has obviously an impact especially on companies who are not from the EU as as we see from uh, from those different uh, from those different recent and not so recent initiatives that also specifically target for example big players those being usually not EU companies but um, to maybe first try to you know structure what we are thinking about here uh, that that title of the session sort of is regimes for intermediary liability. And when I was looking at that, it, uh, I realized that neither of the two words is necessarily very clear. So what an intermediary is, has been also um, increasingly uh, increasingly used in interchangeably, more recently with, with platforms and even more so with different type of platforms. So the discussions we used to have before about safe harbors and, and uh, let's say uh, several, um, several uh, kinds of um, services that could benefit from liability exemptions, like in the case of, of um, mere conduit or caching and so forth, the hosting most importantly, these debates are no longer using that vocabulary. And so when we look at the more, more recent developments in, in liability of, of different intermediaries, um, we, we get to see new concepts being developed, not necessarily those of hosting providers, but different types of platforms, different types of online services, and then and then this is one of the, the big uh, mapping exercise maybe to be undertaken to, to, to have exactly like previously with, with payment a better overview. If that's only a development that one can observe, for example, in EU law or, or more generally as well in other, in other jurisdictions. And if so, what exactly is in and what exactly is out of scope of, of certain new uh, rules related to the liability of, of intermediaries. So examples there, there are plenty of, especially um, uh, coming from EU law, um, you, you could observe notions like um, intermediary service providers involved in uh, online intermediation service, like in the case of the so-called platform to business regulation. But in, the, in case of consumer law, which I know best, we have uh, rules operating with different notions like online marketplaces and, and, and search engines and, and, and so on. So um, this is one of the kind of stock taking uh, exercise at the very beginning to know what intermediaries actually are. Then the second one is this liability. So liability, when we think about intermediary liability, usually that comes from safe harbors and, and liability exemptions, specifically secondary liability. But the tendency that we observe is actually that an increasing number of obligations are actually imposed on platforms and those obligations can uh, then attract their own like primary liability for the violations of the respective obligations. And these can be sometimes um, sort of innocuous in their form, like in consumer law, often we have information duties, let's say on ranking parameters, but what that potentially involves in practice is um, maybe reprogramming the entire like uh, infrastructure so as to make the decisions more explainable to consumers. So that also uh, is is um, is uh, interesting to see what some sort of a small duties that trigger liability might actually uh, mean in practice. Uh, another uh, tendency that generally can be observed also uh, is the fact that the increased obligations related to certain kinds of intermediary intermediary uh, activities. So, for example, um, duties of care related to to, um, uh, to responding to certain uh, to certain notices and maybe even taking more proactive measures and protecting different parties from certain uh, types of content, and they 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 are um, one could argue potentially um, a sort of a global trend. So we can see an increasing focus on um, how to make platforms, due to their private power, more. Uh, more um, proactively involved in, in different, in different um, uh, goals. However, the fact that these uh, obligations and then they're also in, to some extent also um, the liabilities, both primary and secondary, uh, is increasing. Uh, generally in many jurisdictions doesn't necessarily mean that those developments across the world are fundamental, fundamentally similar. So when we compare, for example, the discussions in 
um, in the United States, for example, on section 230, uh, you could see very interestingly uh, that, um, that, that currently there is some sort of a momentum to reform section 230, which is the uh, of the Communications Decency Act, uh, which is the sort of the liability exemption that allowed the entire uh, the entire internet economy to develop. But the motivations for doing that, looking at the, the democratic perspective and Republican perspective are very different. So some consider that to be uh, the, 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 the current safe harbor to be a problem because of uh, it allows online misinformation. Others, on the other hand, consider it to be uh, uh, allowing the, the so-called cancel culture. So this uh, fuels kind of the discussion again about, about objectives. So even if fundamentally there's maybe a tendency to expand uh, on those obligations and maybe reduce the scope of safe harbors, the, the kind of the motivations behind might be quite different in different places around the world. So this is also uh, visible, um, for example, uh, within the EU in different member states, when we look at the um, German uh, Network Enforcement Act, which in includes new obligations for platforms, social media especially, to take down content in a particular time. From what I have seen, a similar development also um, took place in Australia. Uh, while in Poland, by contrast, the government, was, which is a conservative government since 2015, is more uh, pushing towards uh, mm, mm, a regulation that would uh, prevent platforms from taking down content too often. So and even if there is a similar direction of making platforms uh, subject to more uh, obligations and liabilities, actually the, the, the motivations here could be uh, quite different. And then, of course, the, the sort of an elephant in the room, maybe the, um, the, uh, the Chinese uh, dimension, which I, I, don't, uh, I don't know very well, but I know myself, but uh, from what I've been reading for the purpose of this, of this uh, seminar was also that also in that sphere, uh, the safe harbor potentially is, is, is becoming uh, less and less uh, extensive. And instead, the greater monitoring of different online content is, is being preferred, and that could uh, have to do uh, with also yet another set, di different set of motivations that the one observed, uh, for example, under EU law, where 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 um, it it could have to do also with with the monitoring also of of uh, online expression and and generally greater control uh, on of of what's going on uh, on the internet. So uh, these are some are some of the general points I wanted to make, and I'm happy to look at that also from trade perspective. And thank you for coming. Great, thanks a lot. So we go back to Laurent. Uh, Professor Mandarier has a problem with this connection and giving in the pass the passcode is going to connect from his uh, cell phone. Okay. So while we wait, otherwise the floor is open. Martina. Yeah, just very quickly, like, just adding more questions to the questions. Uh, one thing which I think we need to discuss uh, in our uh, seminars uh, is um, the issue of having on one end uh, safe harbors and uh, like uh, letting platforms uh, like on, on, in one way be uh, not liable for what happens on, 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 the, on the platform itself and the issue of um, content uh, on, the, on the monitoring of the platforms, the, the obligation of platform to monitor certain things because what I hear, what I see also in the recent uh, EU um, legislation and proposals is that uh, there is clearly this uh, like uh, uh, wide uh, intermediate liability uh, regime, uh, but then and and, um, and they also um, there is a prohibition for requiring platform to mon monitor content. But on the other hand, platforms are required to monitor content for several um, uh, different areas. So I think it. There we need to discuss and understand what what can what is proportional, what is uh, like uh, justifiable, and and what becomes then a requirement to monitor content uh, independently on how they call it in practice. Okay, thanks, Laurent. Are you with us? I'm not sure his audio is working. He, he, he can't hear us or we can't hear him? I'm not sure. I sent him a message, but I can see that there is no audio sign next to his name. 
Ah. So I'll try to call him on the phone. Okay. I'll try to call because he's connecting from his phone right now as apparently the Wi-Fi just disconnected. I'm not supposed to say this, but I'll say it anyway. We are in Italy. <laughs> yeah, Daniel is a comment. Yeah, should I just make a comment while we wait? Yeah, no, go ahead. I don't see you oh, popping up. Uh, yeah, I'm the sorry, mic yeah. doesn't work for him, so okay. we'll try to reconnect. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah, Daniel, go ahead. So I think also we should look a bit on the dynamic of, okay, that the focus of these intermediary liability regimes is often the big companies, but that the negative effects are often on the SMEs, right? That the, like the standards on like which they have to comply with are often so high and require so much monitoring that even though the, the target of these, uh, of these measurements is the big companies, often they benefit from it because they can actually comply with it. Um, so I think maybe also that like, because we talked about SMEs a bit more uh, in previous rounds that we should keep that in mind. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I hope to be with you. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay, all my apologies, there was uh, no uh, uh, real uh, Wi-Fi hash. Okay, so uh, I really thank uh, Agnieszka for this fascinating presentation. I just have very, very few uh, comments. And uh, my comments will be twofold. First of all, uh, I think the, uh, uh, we see very much the issue of uh, internet service providers liability uh, in a framework which is transatlantic. Whereas, as pointed out actually very uh, much in uh, Agnieszka's notes, there is an evolution towards the, uh, uh, of the US in the direction of Europe, so uh, a slow evolution in particular for uh, secondary liability issues. And more in general, the issue focuses much on the visions that China has. Okay, China has been condemned at the WTO, for uh, trying to uh, distort the uh, copyright legislation uh, in order to uh, use uh, these in forms of censorship uh, upon request of uh, the European Union and the US. So in this very case, uh, 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 certainly enough, as far as we are concerned today for issues of trade flaws, we are much, much interested in understanding, in getting international worldwide standards or agreements or perhaps a treaty that would permit to establish a, a, a better interaction on this topic since this is extremely disrupting for the uh, security of trade. So more than an issue of data for me for uh, trade flaws, it's an issue of um, security of trade. And this is basically the main comment I would wish to make at this very stage. And I congratulate Agnieszka for uh, her presentation. Could you hear me? Yeah, very good. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, I think it was a very important point. And it does raise also the question of, okay, so where does that get done, right? So what's, what's, uh, where do countries sit around the table to actually think <laughs> about a common uh, regime? Okay, any other? Reactions, questions to pose? If not, I think we have been extremely disciplined and on time. So I think it's been a very useful discussion, lots of questions. Uh, like Martina said, and as is described in the document, you know, the whole idea is we're going to have a lot of follow-up, much more focused sessions <clears throat> on these various topics. We're pretty uh, flexible uh, in terms of adding things to the table. Like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this is part of a CVK project, but there's also other activities, ongoing research projects so we're, where we, we have the capacity to do more. So let's, let us know uh, on that. Um, I really like Bill's notion of an epistemic community. Uh, and in a sense, that's something maybe we can also contribute to. 
So thinking a bit about the mechanics of that is also worth, um, worth doing. Martina, I will give you the last word. Oh, thanks, Bernard. I just wanted to thank you all and especially uh, thank all the PhD and postdoctoral students from the UI who accepted the, my invite very last minute. Uh, uh, I think it gave a, a huge uh, and a very positive impression about all the work we are doing in our universities. And I think having this project grounded on universities is a great way of uh, making possible to remain apolitical uh, and also uh, keep the project uh, being alive and uh, um, going forward uh, over the years. So really looking forward to start uh, working together. Okay, so thanks to you all, especially those of you who are in time zones far away from Europe uh, for, for devoting the time to this. And I look forward to being in touch and to future events. Thanks.